Hi there. Right, um, before we get started, uh, this is a bit of an interactive uh, presentation. So what I want you to do is I want you to visit this link, which is bit.ly slash futurejs. And um, a lot of this is demo uh, rather than talk. So, um, and we're relying on conference Wi-Fi, which is a notoriously bad thing to rely on. Uh, so if you are going to be doing any downloads or updating programs, try not to, uh, if that's all right. OK, cool, we've got 30 people. And um, that's a lot. Cool. <laughs> right, so uh, I'm Ben. Uh, I'm based in Oxford, England at the moment. Um, and I work for a company called White October, um, who is like a web development agency. And we also organize conferences. Uh, we've got JS Oxford, which is a small meetup, um, much smaller than this. <laughs> um, and yeah, I help run that. So we're going to talk about uh, multi screen interfaces. So that's where. Um, you have several devices that are part of the same interaction with the web. And uh, this talk is uh, split into to four different parts. So we've got like capabilities, the types of capabilities that we have with devices um, that we can, we can share with one another. Um, transports, about getting that data between different devices. And then some examples of interfaces that, that use this kind of tech. And in the future, what kind of thing we can um, what kind of things we can create by doing this? Um, I've never had over 100 people on this, <laughs> so this could be interesting. Uh, so first, capabilities, right? So when we interact with the web, uh, we do it through a, a number of different devices. And uh, you might think of the baseline as being a laptop. So I've got my laptop here uh, that's loading that web browser. And here we've got um, a keyboard and uh, a touchpad, so we can kind of type in information, and we can move a cursor to click on stuff and drag them. But we interact with the web in, with different devices, right? So, so I've got my phone here. And this phone's a very kind of like different type of device. So if this works, yeah, cool. Um, so instead of moving a cursor and clicking stuff, I can just like press what I want to. And this um, kind of, so I can just touch the objects, which is a little bit more kind of closer to that interaction. Because the touch interface is combined with the screen, I can use that to put up a keyboard and I can like, type stuff. Um, and also, we've got different interactions. Like, so we can touch and drag and like, drag back down against and swipe to the side. We can do multi-screen interactions, so rotating stuff around, resizing things. And we can really kind of like, physically interact with this device in a really kind of unique way that's very different from the way that you interact with a, a laptop. And this device has got more different things as well. So we've got geolocation, so that we can find out where we are in the world, like longitude, latitude. And I need to allow that. <laughs> um, and so you can kind of link this to, uh, to where you are. So we've got like longitude, latitude, and you can see that third parameter is the accuracy of that. Uh, we've got orientation, so you can kind of see which way around this device is pointing. Uh, so you can kind of see where it's pointing in the world. Um, and we've got motion as well, so you can see as we move it around, uh, those axes change. <clears throat> so what happens if we are able to connect these two devices together? So they're both very different, but they both run web browsers. And the web is a great platform for this. So I can load up this presentation on this phone, and it's been resized to kind of fit with this viewport. And the way you change slide on this is by dragging it upwards. And because these two are, are connected, what I've been able to do is I've been able to change that HTML page on that device, which doesn't have touch capability. But by sharing the capabilities of this device, I'm able to slide with my finger, which is something that's not possible with one of these single devices. <gasps> yeah. <laughs> And um, here we've got a file input. And if I was to choose that on my laptop, it would open a, a file, file dialog so I could choose something from my desktop. But there's hints on this which, which change it slightly on this device. So when I choose a, a file, it opens up the camera. So uh, yeah, I'm going to about to take a photo of you guys. So lights on. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, so what happens here? Sorry, one second. Excellent. So when I save that, uh, that can then stream up to that other device. <laughs> and what's nice about this is that these two devices are very physically different, right? So this phone has a really nice camera on it, 
and it's mobile, so I can move it around and get a position which is better for taking a photo. Whereas this device is connected to this massive projector, um, so we'll be able to combine the, the kind of physical properties of those devices um, using the web. Cool. So these, um, I'm not going to actually have any code examples, but I am going to mention any libraries that I use, some of them. Um, so for, for those two demos, uh, we use PeerJS to kind of create a WebRTC data channel connection between the two browsers, uh, which we'll get into later. And part a related project called BinaryJS, which is basically allows you to take large files like images and put that over a WebSocket connection. Um, so I was able to kind of share that image over a WebSocket connection. So detecting browser features, like um, you want to be able to, to utilize the capabilities of it when someone visits your page. And you can find out these features by, by looking at the window or document model, um, document objects. And one tool for using this is like Modernizer. I don't know who uses Modernizer here. Is it? Yeah, people. <laughs> Great. Uh, so here are a few of the features that you can, um, you can detect using Modernizer, so just by checking if they're available or not. And um, what I was able to do, like, so when you first connected to that URL, what we did was we looked at the features from this list, which every device connects. And now we can actually visualize every device in the audience, um, the features of all of them. Um, so you can see that it's like, so we've got quite sporadic report, uh, support for battery API. Like, usually that's, Firefox has really good support for this. And we've got like, uh, bits and pieces like the GamePads APIs. Like, actually, what's interesting about the GamePads API is you can see how it's more solid on the left-hand side. And that's because people with laptops were able to type in the URL faster and connect. So laptops, it makes more sense to kind of um, connect a gamepad to it, whereas a phone you might use as a gamepad, maybe. But that's a different thing. Um, yeah, cool. A thing to notice about this is that like, there's a lot of blue here. Like, we, there's a lot of things that we can use, right? And, so, and a lot of them are quite buried. Uh, so stuff like Modernizer helps you um, work out what you can and can't use, and that's the kind of important thing to try and, like, devices vary, is what I'm trying to say. Cool. So we're going to concentrate on four of these features, and uh, if you get your phones out, um, there's a bit of an interactive thing here. Um, so what we've got is we've got uh, geolocation, touch events, device orientation, which we've already touched on, and also WebRTC, which allows that kind of peer-to-peer uh, networking and audio video streaming between devices. And so what we're going to do is, if you look at your phones, you should see these four sliders for, uh, for these features. And I want you to kind of say how experienced you are with each of them. So on the left is you've not touched it at all. On the right, you kind of like know it to the depth of the core of it. Um, and cool, we're getting quite a good spread. Um, so. Yeah, myself, I'm kind of like middle of the road for these for geolocation and touch events. Device orientation, I have hacked around with a little bit, but not to any depth. And WebRTC, I think I've done, done more on. Uh, so is, that, is everyone cool? Cool. Right, so now your sliders should change to awesomeness, like how we think this, uh, these features are going to impact the web now or in the future. Um, so cool. We're up on the awesomeness, <laughs> uh, which is nice. Uh, so, yeah, I think geolocation is really important because it's like it gives us a way of the web interacting with our world kind of thing. And, yeah, touch events have removed a huge bottleneck in the way that we interact with computers. Um, cool. Right. Is everyone all right? Cool. So now that we've got those two data points, we can plot those together. And we've got this, um, this kind of scattergram of awesomeness and experience. And I like to think of this as like four different quadrants, right? So we've got this like top right side, and that is um, where we think the technology is awesome, and we're really into it. Like we we know how to phys like to practically do stuff with it. And in that space, we can we can really do some awesome things, like some really kind of that's where we can move the web forward. This bottom right one. So there's quite a lot of people who think things are awesome but haven't actually touched it at all. And that's a really great place to be, because it's very easy to move from that quadrant upwards, because you think that 
you know that that technology is awesome, and so it's really easy to kind of get to know it and, and learn how to use it practically. Uh, the top left one, which is, um, that's really interesting space. That's basically, you know something really well, but you think it's rubbish, um, which is quite an interesting place to be. And it's like, it's harder to move from there across to here than it is from there to there. And then the last quadrant, uh, where we think things aren't awesome and aren't experienced in it, that's actually a really good place to be as well, because as you get experienced, you can kind of see how, how awesome a technology can be. So yeah, you've got all this space to explore. All right. So that, as I mentioned, uses Modernizer um, to kind of detect those features, and then PubNub for, uh, for gathering them and also for keeping your slides in sync with mine. So what we have is like PubNub is a basically publish, subscribe infrastructure, pretty cool thing. And what you can do is you can basically every device subscribes to this presentation channel with a certain state, and that state has your features in it, and we're able to, I'm able to look them up and plot them on the graph with D3. <clears throat> cool. So we're talking about the capabilities of the web, and, but I think an important thing to note is that the web doesn't start at browsers. Like, the web, web's a lot bigger. The web's what's, browsers present the web for us. And there's a whole lot of other devices which, which don't actually, um, they don't actually have a browser or even a screen. So this part hardly ever works, so we'll see. <laughs> uh, yeah, cool. Uh, this is a, a sensor tag, right? So this is a little Bluetooth low energy device that, um, I can connect to with a no process on there and expose through web APIs. And this doesn't have a screen, and it doesn't have a browser, uh, but we can still kind of make it part of the web. So for instance, so some of the capabilities of this is it's got buttons, so I can press these on and off, and you can see that kind of updating those two buttons on the top. But it's also got other data, so you've got temperature. So these two numbers are the ambient temperature and also the point temperature, so I can work out how hot something is by just pointing it at it, and you can see that my computer is hotter than the room, slightly. Um, it's a very different way of interacting with the web. We've got basic gyroscope motion, everything, and, uh, which is a bit more basic than the, the one on my phone, but um, it's still, this is, what's interesting about this is this is powered in terms of like months or years rather than like days, uh, which is quite a different, different scale of thing. And we've also got magnetometer, uh, which detects a magnetic field around it. So we're sensing very different things about our, our world through this device, but we can make it part of the web by exposing it over web APIs and utilizing the utilizing endpoints and HTTP. So, and I think Jenny puts this really well, that we make a mistake if we think of the web as only HTML. And it's like the web is so much bigger than this. And as web developers, that's like our domain. And we can kind of do some great stuff in there. Transports. Cool. So you've got, um, if you've got several devices together next to each other, one of the big issues that you've got to, or not issue, one of the things you've got to deal with is getting data from one to the other. And there's, using the web, so there's a kind of, um, this can be a bit of a problem. So here we've got this big circle, which is a web server, and we've got these two browsers connected. And the first browser changes some information and puts it up to the, the web server. But we get this bit of a problem that the second uh, browsers come along, and it doesn't know that that information has changed on the server, so it doesn't know to make that extra request to say, give me the new information. And so there's a few ways around this. So the first one's polling, where you just repeatedly make requests to the web server to, to get new information um, at a great overhead sometimes. Uh, we've got long polling, which is slightly better, where you make a request and the server holds on to it until the data's changed, then you return it. Then we've got web sockets where you can create a duplex connection to the server. So basically, as stuff comes up, you can just pipe it straight back down the other side. Um, so that makes it. Oh, cool. <laughs> I don't know what happened there. Cool. Um, and then, but then all our traffic has to still go through a server, which is where WebRTC comes in. Uh, so WebRTC lets you negotiate a peer to peer connection between those two devices. Um, bypassing the server. So we're going to look at that. Uh, 
I have got a lot of demos. <laughs> this is kind of weird. Uh, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to send events from this device to that one. Um, and I'm going to do it over four channels. So we're going to use WebRTC, um, WebSockets, long polling, and a delayed long polling uh, to emulate a kind of server with, that's further away or slower. So you should watch carefully because it's quite fast. So I can start drawing. And you can see these top two are streaming those points, whereas the bottom two are coming in in chunks. And you can also, you might be able to make out that the, the WebRTC is slightly faster than the, the WebSockets. And that makes all the difference when you've got devices that are, are next to each other. Because as I start drawing another um, angle on that, when I'm looking at that other screen, it, if it reacts slightly quicker, it feels a lot more natural. So that's important. So what we can do with this is like, so we've got these stars, but it's kind of hard to see. Uh, so we can transform these and, and use the z-axis for time. So if you imagine as those drawings occurred, it's kind of coming out at you. And now that we're looking, thinking of it in 3D, we can actually rotate this round and look at it from the time axis. Right? So you've got, thanks. <laughs> So you can see the two streaming things, uh, the WebRTC and the WebSockets are good and smooth lines. They get a bit chunky here, but that's more to do with my implementation of it. <laughs> um, so if I've got any advice, if you're making something real time, try not to use four channels at the same time. Uh, that doesn't work very well. Um, you can see the, the long polling meshes get bigger as you get a, a higher latency to the server. Um, and that's because in between the requests, the response and the next request, more data has come through onto that server. A really interesting, I find really interesting point to note is that little red dot here, uh, the first one. And that's the first long polling response. And that comes in at pretty much the same time as the WebSockets. And what's interesting about that is that um, basically, if you've got sporadic one off updates, then long polling can be as fast as WebSockets. You don't need the full kind of like streaming fanciness. You can, you can use something more basic and easier. Uh, that's everything. Cool. So for that, uh, PeerJS, which I mentioned before, is the WebRTC connection. Socket.io does everything else. And 3JS lets you turn things around. Um, that's all I use it for, really. Um, cool. So we're going to talk quickly about the types of interfaces that you can do by considering devices in close proximity to each other um, and why these are different from what we're doing just now. So uh, this is our Christmas party last December. And what we're doing is we're, we're playing a game of Pictionary. And the person up at the front is waving a marker in front of a webcam and drawing pictures. And everyone else in the room is connected on their phone to that service, and they're seeing those pictures, and they've gotten, they're able to guess what the image is. And then those guessed images come up on the, the right-hand side of that, that main projector. And what's nice about this is, like, so everyone in the room had their own devices out, but it only really makes sense because we're in the same room. Like, so we're using web technology, which is designed to kind of like connect together the world, but we're all in this like gallery. And another thing is, like, so Everyone was on their phones at a party, but that wasn't a bad thing. That kind of, it really fitted with our, our social interactions. So we, what we were doing is like, we weren't playing with the web, we were playing a game. And the web augmented that game and made it, made it more fun, possibly. Um, but yeah, that was our Christmas party. Another, in, another interesting use case of having separate devices. Now this isn't a website, um, this is like some sound editing software. And what you can do is, so it's got this kind of skeuomorphic sound desk at the bottom of it. And you use your mouse to kind of drag sliders up and down or, or turn, thing, turn knobs around. And what you can do is you can get a companion app for this which sits on an iPad. And what's nice about this is that turning dials on a touch screen is a lot more intuitive than dragging it with your mouse. And sliding sliders is, is also a lot more natural. And because it's a multi-touch interface, 
you're able to drag multiple sliders at the same time to edit things, which is something that's not actually physically possible with your interaction with the laptop. So by taking off the second device, you're able to kind of utilize its capability set a lot more. Um, this isn't a web project, but it's like, it could be. So. <coughs> Uh, this is another interesting one, which is uh, YouTube TV. So if you go to youtube.com slash TV, it kind of switches the modality into being more of like, a, yeah, less something you navigate. So it's kind of full screen and all that kind of stuff. And you can connect your phone to that, and you're able to kind of choose what videos you want to play and kind of skip through them or whatever. And um, why I picked this is that this is, Potentially, this could be quite a, a, a weird way, like you're doing something on this device and that one's changing. But it replaces a really natural um, concept in our mind, which is a remote control. So everyone is familiar with changing, changing channels on a TV. And using the web to kind of replace that functionality or using, yeah, uh, allows us to instantly know what we're about to do and understand it. And this is what I think um, we should take as inspiration for how we develop devices. So this is a girl like, trying to log in, trying to use a mouse, I guess, for the first time. And it's just like technology can kind of come around again to be natural to us. And, and with touch screens, for instance, you can just like, there's nothing more natural than be able to reach out and just touch and transform something with your hands. And uh, yeah, I, I always I like trying to think of, think of this. <laughs> Cool. And these are some patterns for, for multi-screen. This is from a few years ago, actually. Uh, some patterns for multi-screen interfaces and how you kind of share data around. And the one that we, the first one we hear, see is uh, coherence. And that's something that we'll probably have most experience with. Like, that's responsive web design, like making content suit a particular device um, and be more appropriate for it. And then the other one's kind of concern how you share data between those devices and kind of how a user feels when they're using them. And screen sharing is an interesting one. Uh, and we're going to look at that just now. OK, <laughs> cool. So we had a 100, you need to get your phones out again. Uh, we had a 196 devices connected. Um, and as well as all the features uh, that we saw at the start, 197, great. <laughs> um, we also captured the screen resolutions. So we can view those now. So this is like every resolution, um, every screen in all our devices. And if you think of like standard screen sharing apps or whatever, what you do is you would overlay an image over all of these and have it kind of copied out. But because we're dealing with all these devices in close proximity to each other, we can actually do screen sharing in a slightly different way. So if we think of this space as being virtual, we can actually arrange all these, um, these screens within that space, right? <clears throat> and so we're basically transforming every device into their own positions. And what we can do is now when we, when we choose to share an image, every device is able to kind of show their own part of that image. Um, that might not have worked. <laughs> Did it work? Yeah. Cool. Great. <laughs> um, so this only, <laughs> sorry, you got the sky. That's a bad one. I tried to pick a complex picture, but uh, I, yeah, the sky sucks. So yeah, this only makes sense because all our devices are together. So it's like a kind of different type of interface. And, um, and so. What I can do is I can actually attach this other device here. So this is down the bottom. I've got a tree. <laughs> and this device is connected slightly differently. So this has got a web sockets connection. So what I can do is I can actually just touch on here, uh, possibly. Hmm. I might reload that. Yeah, so I can touch, and I can actually move this image around. And you can't, and then when I let go, that then publishes over to all your devices. So, <laughs> thanks. And 
also, like, so we're utilizing, t oh, yeah, we're doing a lot of stuff there. But uh, I can add another device to this. So I've got this tablet here. So I can add this second device, and everything should rejiggle. And I can touch with this new device, but I can also still touch the old device. And what we've got is like we've got a kind of like inter-device multi-touch gesture here. Um, so. Yeah. And what's quite nice about this is like it, it does feel quite weirdly natural, like maybe not with so many people, but, but it's like for me, touching those two devices, I kind of like know what's going to happen. Um, and it feels like the right thing does happen. And um, yeah. So we can do that. So the future, uh, so like taking this stuff forward. Um, I really like this example. This is an uh, Atari video game console game called uh, Adventure. It was like 1979. And games preceding this were games like Pong or um, Pac-Man. And in those games, uh, the, the player's model of the world was constrained by the screen. So your entire world within that game was that screen. So in, in Pong, your world was this tennis court. And in Pac-Man, your world was this crazy maze. Um, whereas this game had something slightly different, where if you walk off the bottom of that screen, you appear on the top in a completely new part of this world. And the player's concept of their presence within the game has just been drastically broadened, right? Like, so suddenly, you've got this like, huge cave system, possibly infinite. And what I find really interesting about this is that the technology didn't change at all. So it's using exact same hardware, exact same developers are developing it. But their concept of how a player can play it has broadened the horizons of how a person can interact with that technology. And I think, so with the web, it's like, Although in the next few years, there's going to be some really insanely great stuff that's, that's coming out. The actual way that we innovate is through concepts and the way that we imagine that people can interact with the web. And I'm going to leave, like, last slide. Um, this is my favorite quote at the moment, and I'll read it, which is, my freedom will be so much the greater and more meaningful the more narrowly I limit my field of action and the more I surround myself with obstacles. And what I take from this is that for us to be truly creative, we need to have constraints, and we need to be pushing up against those constraints. And it's up to us to choose where those constraints lie. So a constraint might be to have a button look exactly the same over all browsers, or to try and fit some kind of data into some library which doesn't really suit it. But we can actually broaden our constraints like almost outside the implementation and think about how people interact with technology and how we can kind of push that forward. Cool. So yeah, I'm Benjamin Benben -Ben on Twitter. And uh, yeah, White October sent me today. So thank you. Cool. <laughs>
drawing stuff on my phone and mm -hmm. streaming it across that I could be like, oh, I'll just turn it around like that. And I was like, oh, shit. Nice. Brilliant. <laughs> what did you actually so, use to do it? Uh, D3 for the okay, uh, strap swaps. For the... No, sorry. That was 3JS. The okay. rest was mostly D3. Cool. Which we'll learn about. Any more questions? Yeah, there we go. I've got a couple. One on this side. Either one. Um, yeah, I, I program, um, well, this is weird. Uh, I make a little program to synchronize a song through many laptops. And in a hackathon of my company, we try and we were maybe 25 people. And I was controlling when in every laptop was appearing some images. Mm -hmm. And we had a big delay. Yeah. So what's your experience uh, on these kind of games? It was something yeah. I was doing wrong. I was using WebSockets. Yeah, yeah. So, because WebSockets have always got to go through a server, right? Like, so if that kind of gets a bit plunked up or something like that, then that can be slowed down. Like, so we, we did some stuff in using Web Audio to actually use the audio to sync, so from the actual devices themselves, because you've got that kind of main track that you can listen to. So we tried that. We didn't get that far with it. But then um, one of the things that you can do is like, try and work out the offsets of all the timestamps of the different devices. And then, so you've got like 10 devices and they're all kind of like, have their own internal clocks. And if you can work out how they all, the deltas between them, then you can say this first device starts playing it at its timestamp of X, and then you can translate that through the other devices. So that's quite a, a handy way of doing that. Um, Okay, so Aaron, like the technology is not there yet, like the transport <laughs> protocol is not there yet, so you have to make these little hacks. Yeah, well, it's, it's not so much a hack, it's like, I mean, the thing with this kind of tech is like, we're, we sometimes resolve problems that are happening that have already been solved with like distributed computing or whatever like that, so you've got like, I don't know, clock synchronization protocols or whatever, um, which would probably, you could probably use the web for that, but yeah, there'll be stuff. I don't know. The data's still <laughs> got to travel down a pipe as well. And if Sorry? it's traveling to different computers down different pipes, it's, it's going to take different amounts of time. Um, I guess however good the technology gets that's, that's linking those two things together, you've still got data going down a pipe or through the air or something. And that, that's just a, a variable that you don't have control over. Um, this question over there as well. Hi. Can you explain a little bit how, how you did the multi-touch, multi-device thing? Yeah, cool. Actually, that's really interesting. Like, so I said, so every device has its own transform matrix for um, sh for taking that image and transforming it into its own part of it. And if you work out that transform matrix, you can actually take those touch events and invert that transform matrix and pass them back through the other way. So then you get the kind of the touch in the virtual space, and then. I, on my laptop, I refire those as emulated touch events. So on the laptop, it's actually kind of, it's as if I'm touching it, um, which has got this really interesting bug that if I go like that on my phone, it sometimes switches to the next slide. Uh, by, yeah, it's quite So if you do a two-finger touch in one place and two-finger touch in the other one, it, go, it, comes, to, it comes to like a four-finger touch? It, it could do, actually. I'm not, I've not tried that, that which is weird. Not brave enough. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Thank you. That's great. That's all we've got time for. Thanks, man. Cool. Thanks.